Good evening and welcome to the first Ethics in AI Colloquium of this year, brought to you by the Institute for Ethics and AI here at Oxford. My name is Linda Eggert. I'm an early career fellow in philosophy, and I'll be your host tonight. Our topic for this evening is AI, democracy, and the common good. Because our lives are shaped by decisions made by other people. And these other people include scientists and technologists, and they do the most amazing things. They save lives and create extraordinary, powerful tools. But it's also become a bit of a truism that whether we like it or not, AI has penetrated almost every aspect of our lives, as people and as citizens from our social and dating lives, to health diagnostics, to criminal justice. And almost every piece written on the topic includes some form of acknowledgement that AI applications play a significant role in school admissions, policing and bail, as well as access to employment, state benefits, credit, and even life-saving organs. So, it would be easy to start with what sounds like another truism, that certain scientific and technological advances raise powerful and urgent questions about how democratic societies should harness the benefits of powerful new innovations while containing the risks they might pose. But that's not the only question one might see in tonight's topic. The authority of science and technology comes from a very different place than the authority of democracy. What's true in science and what works in technology doesn't rest on agreement and compromise between citizens. And this clash between different kinds, different sources of authority, bubbles up when we think about the idea of the common good. Who should decide what people need and value? To what extent should the values and assumptions of scientists and creators and shapers of technology reflect the assumptions and values of other people about what they find important? Whose values should guide the design of the future? And what relation does designing the future bear to participating in democracy? To tackle this topic, we're delighted that Professor Mark Huckleback has joined us this evening and that Professor Zena Pamuk and Isabel Ferraris have agreed to serve as commentators. Each of them has an illustrious career and a long list of achievements that we just don't have time for, but you can look them up on the internet and I'll give you just the shortest of versions. So Professor Mark Kuckelbeck is a philosopher of technology in the philosophy department at the University of Vienna. And he's also the holder of the chair, the Institute of Philosophy in the Czech Academy of Sciences. He served as the president of the International Society of Technology, is a member of numerous expert groups, including the European Commission's high level expert group on AI and the Austrian UNESCO Commission's expert council on the ethics of AI. He's written no fewer than 18 books, many of which have been translated into several different languages. And his newest book on AI democracy will be published in just over a month. So thank you very much, Mark, for being here with us. Professor Zeynep Pamuk is an associate professor in contemporary political theory in the Department of Politics and International Relations and a professorial fellow here at Nuffield College. Previously, she was an assistant professor in the Department of Government at the LSE, and before that, in the Department of Political Science at the University of California, San Diego, after having been a supernumerary fellow in politics here at St. John's College, just down the road. The focus of her work is on democratic theory, the role of expertise in politics, and the impact of AI and automation on democracy. Her first book, Politics and Expertise, 
has won the American Political Science Association's Foundations of Political Theory section first book award. And we're so delighted and so grateful, Zainab, that you're here with us tonight. So thank you. Our second commentator, Isabel Flores, is a visiting fellow at the Institute for Ethics and AI this year and a professor of sociology at the University of Louvain's Department of Social and Political Sciences. She's also a senior research associate at the Center for Labor and Just Economy at Harvard Law School. She's a member of Belgium's Royal Academy of Sciences, Humanities and the Arts, and has also served as the president of Belgium's Royal Academy. Again, amongst many other things, she coordinates a global network on democratizing work and has written several books on the topic, most recently, also coming out this year, Democratizing the Corporation. I'm very grateful that you're here with us tonight, Isabel, not least because it meant turning down what I know to have been a very glamorous invitation. Not that we're not glamorous, but we're especially honored that you're here, so thank you for joining us. Um, now, Mark's going to have about 30 minutes for his keynote. This will be followed by comments and remarks from Zainab and Isabel. Then I'll give Mark a few minutes to respond and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. With that, I'm going to wish you all a stimulating and enjoyable evening. So now please join me in welcoming Mark Kekelbeck. Yeah, thank you, uh, Linda, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, thank you also for, to the Institute of Ethics and AI to um, invite me here for this talk. It's, uh, it's good to be in such good company and I'm looking forward also to your uh, views and uh, your comments. So let me say a little bit where this talk comes from. So um, the talk is about a book, but it is also about my interest in thinking about what could be the relation between AI um, and the common good. And it's the, the background is also like, how can I think about, like how, what, what could I comment on the current ways um, that AI governance is done. So this is what I will do um, today. Um, and the background for the, the book I wrote is a, a concern about democracy, a concern uh, that I think many of, many of you will recognize. Um, we see today in the world, um, in, in Europe also, um, it's a certain tendencies that are authoritarian or um, right populist. And um, the question then is like, yeah, how might AI contribute to such tendencies? Um, and what does it mean also for, you know, even if we don't move towards, which I hope towards authoritarianism and totalitarianism, uh, what could be the risks for democracy? Um, so that's what the, what the book is about. Um, so I wanted to know two things. One is what is the impact of AI on democracy? Um, and second, um, how can we make sure more constructively um, that AI supports democracy? So that's the, the two parts of the book. And the answer, very short, is uh, first of all that AI, as it's currently developed and used, undermines fundamental principles and a knowledge basis on which our democracies are built and does not contribute to the common good. And then in the more positive part, um, I indicate some pathways to democratize AI. Some of them are more obvious perhaps than others. Um, among the non-obvious ones are the cultural and educational conditions that I think are needed for um, a rich ideal of democracy and a normative orientation towards the common good. So let me um, briefly go through the book because there is not so much time, but the main thing is to stimulate discussions uh, on, on this topic. So first I looked at the history of um, technology and democracy. Um, and what I found was that already um, from a time of Plato, um, cybernetics, which I like to use rather than artificial intelligence here to make the connection, 
um, that cybernetics was seen in an authoritarian way, namely by Plato. Plato said that steering a ship is something that should not be delegated to uh, those who um, yeah, are, are the, the common people, those who um, are rowing the ship. No, it should be done by people who have expertise, who know what they're doing. And this, of course, has been in political philosophy the start of a lot of discussions about um, what is the, the role of knowledge in democracies, what could be tensions between the need for expertise on the one hand and, and also the need for democracy on the other hand. But I see definitely this, what I call a political cybernetics in Plato as the beginning of a tradition that goes more an authoritarian direction when it comes to technology. Um, and you can see that today when people, whether in government or in big tech, say like, well, you know, the future of this technology, leave it to us. Um, you know, this is not something that um, people should decide about. Um, when I looked at the wider history of technology and democracy, I also noticed this tendency towards centralization. Um, one of the biggest shifts in human history is the shift towards agricultural civilizations. And uh, that was at the same time a shift towards centralization, where technologies played the role already of supporting that central power, um, the kings, priests, uh, and so on. And um, again, this is not so different today, where um, both in private and public sector, there is a concentration of power based on artificial intelligence. So these are not such good beginnings for the discussion. I also um, cleared the field first by asking like, okay, what do we mean by AI and democracy? Um, maybe it's good to mention that with AI, I don't only mean the software, hardware, and all the material conditions for that, but also the narratives we uh, make about the technological future. Um, democracy, that is of course then the, the main question, what do we mean by democracy? And there I distinguish between democracy as um, a conception about voting, voting procedures, and everything that has to do with that, um, also representative systems, um, versus a richer republican ideal um, that we can find in the history of IDs, and um, where the idea is that, that self-rule um, requires active participation and some orientation to the common good. So this is where I draw on in the book um, as a kind of source for, for these more normative ideas. Um, in those republican ideals of democracy, the idea is that democracy itself has some intrinsic value, um, that there are some things about democracy that are good per se. For example, learning to see the perspective of others, developing shared understanding, um, developing a shared public space to talk with one another. These are ideas that um, yeah, by themselves are seen as, as very valuable and constitutive of democracy. What I will stress a lot is the knowledge required for that, the expertise on the part of citizens, um, and therefore also education. And then one should keep in mind that, of course, democracy is an ideal. Um, one could say, paraphrasing Gandhi, that um, you know, democracy, I think it would be a good idea. Um, the, the extent to which we have democracies, both in the West and elsewhere, um, is an open uh, question. Um, taking a global perspective there is also good. Um, we have a lot of mixed systems, actually, one could say, uh, globally speaking. So if we talk about this topic, then it could be widened to um, those questions as well. So how does AI undermine the, um, democracy? Well, first of all, of course, uh, democracy as voting is also something that we need to talk about. Um, manipulation of voters is now possible via social media using um, AI to analyze individual profiles. Um, people can be targeted individually based on their profile. And so we have in AI a very powerful instrument for influencing voters 
and this will be, um, it is already a problem now in current elections, in the upcoming American elections, for example, it will be a big problem. We can brace ourselves for a lot of scandals and cases there. So this is definitely a danger and something we need to talk about. However, I, add, adding to, to that, I make the point that AI also undermines a number of fundamental liberal democratic and republican democratic principles. And I think that's very important to also look at those um, because for me, indeed, democracy is that richer ideal um, rooted in ancient republicanism, but also the further developed in the Enlightenment, where we have principles like freedom, equality and fraternity. Fraternity is often forgotten. Luckily, in contemporary political philosophy, we have, again, some more attention to this. Um, and next to that, of course, rule of law, uh, tolerance, very important liberal democratic principle, um, which are all needed for democracy to work. Um, and that's, of course, difficult then when there is a subversion of autonomy, uh, power asymmetries, and uh, when on social media the discussion space is undermined um, in, in various ways. Um, and what I especially emphasize in the book it's, is that epistemic conditions, they're necessary for democracy. Um, and the way I do that is first um, being inspired by the work of Hannah Arendt. Um, Arendt, who um, uh, wrote in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, that um, totalitarianism benefits from the social isolation, from a not sharing a world, um, from the impossibility to distinguish truth from untruth, um, from bureaucratic thoughtlessness, lack of interest in understanding others' point of view, and, and mistrust. And it's these kind of epistemic, social epistemic conditions, I think, that are being eroded when uh, and to the extent that AI, um, first of all, risks to undermine that knowledge and trust basis um, when it creates power asymmetries, for example, big tech versus ordinary citizens, when people are manipulated, um, when the distinction between what's real and fake is um, uh, becomes a problem uh, through the, to, for example, fake videos, but also fake audio, for example, we have cases, and uh, the creation of so-called epistemic bubbles where people um, mainly hear voices of their own communities, of their own political uh, spheres, and uh, do not, uh, are not so exposed to others and do not want to be exposed to the views of others. Um, also, destruction of trust, trust in the state, but also trust between citizens, which Arendt thought was so uh, problematic for uh, totalitarianism. Um, the power asymmetries are there, and um, yeah, in the end, also the further erosion of the image of the autonomous political subject. Um, that image is partly rightly um, problem, uh, seen as problematic in the sense that we are relational beings and autonomy is not something that, that is absolute and that should be seen in a non-social way. Um, however, the, the kind of um, undermining of autonomy that we see here through um, possibilities of nudging through AI, where um, under the radar of people's practical rationality, um, there is influencing of choices, political choices and others, well, th that is uh, definitely problematic and um, is something that, that um, yeah, needs to be, be addressed. Um, so if that's the case, and of course in the book I'm much more detailed about all these um, risks, um, if that's the case, like, um, first of all, we can ask how can we make democracy more resilient in the face of these risks, right? So, and that's a pretty classical question with many potential, potential classical answers, but I will also offer another one. Uh, and then more the, the, the positive constructive question, like what can AI do for democracy? Um, just as AI can also do a lot of other good things, uh, how can we use AI to, to strengthen democracy? So these are two different um, aspects in the um, second part of the book. And um, yeah, when it comes to the classic recipes, I talk about, of course, participation and deliberation 
uh, by citizens in deciding about our technological future. Um, I call quality journalism that is so important to create that epistemic basis. Um, and of course, regulation of AI um, and political discussion as opposed to techno solutionism, the idea that we need always technological solutions um, only. So these are important things, but I also propose that we need um, new kind of institutions that link technology development in a more permanent, structural, institutional way to democratically elected bodies. Because what I see what happens today is that ad hoc many um, committees, uh, advisory councils are set up at all kinds of levels, from the level of uh, the nation state to the level of the UN nowadays. Um, but it's always like trying to in invent the wheel again. It's always ad hoc, like, oh my God, we have a new technology, we have to do something. And I think what I would like to see in a democracy is that we address the problem of the relation between expertise and democratic participation in a way that makes sure that expertise flows um, in a transparent uh, and permanent way to political decision makers and political leadership um, and at the same time that participation in that process is guaranteed and potentially supported by AI. So I think that's an important institutional proposal. Um, what is also uh, a question in the background there that uh, of course needs to be addressed is like what should be this, uh, the relation between public and private when it comes to AI? Should we really leave the um, important platforms for potentially you know public sphere should we leave them completely in the hands of uh, private actors um, or can we do this in a different way how should we uh, deal with that and and of course there are extreme views there there are also other views but i think it's a discussion we need to have and then um, yeah also the question like at what level should we coordinate uh, policy for ai I think there the global level is also important given that, that you know, AI crosses many borders. Then when it comes to AI for democracy, um, there is already in the area of philosophy of technology, uh, social uh, studies of science and technology, there's a lot of ideas about how to embed values, ethical values into technology. And I propose that we do the same with political uh, values and principles. Um, so that we have a democratic kind of AI development, um, which again needs to be linked to all these other things. Um, but I think that uh, that is definitely um, important. It, why? Because it does, uh, instead of waiting until AI is there and then saying like, like uh, now we have to regulate it, which is currently happening, for example, in, at the level of European uh, Commission and uh, the other European institutions, um, instead of, of, of doing things, you know, like, like fire, um, uh, like extinguishing the fire afterwards, I think we need to make sure that, um, yeah, this development is already more democratic and um, uh, regulated in that sense uh, during development. Then, of course, this participatory and deliberative democracy element, given my, my assumptions, is, are important. Um, there, there is already, some people are busy uh, with thinking about uh, how can we organize this deliberation um, and, and what role could AI play there. And it's good to know that there are ideas like, yeah, we could AI, uh, use AI, for example, to summarize positions. So that in that way to inform the deliberation. Um, translation is, of course, also an important supportive function that AI can, can do there. Um, also in the global context, this will be more and more important. Um, and so I also, for example, to make people reflect on their own political position, uh, AI can analyze your profile. Um, but all these things, I think, require that also um, human mediators and human, um, humans who somehow also um, yeah, can make sure that this is done in a, in a way that, um, that actually enhances the deliberation. I think there's much more work uh, to be done about that, and uh, I'm not a specialist in the uh, details of how to organize it, but the, um, this, I think, is a great direction. What I 
stress in the book is this knowledge basis, especially in the light of these um, dangers towards totalitarianism. Um, and I make this, this sweeping claim that democrat, uh, democratization projects in this area needs a renaissance, needs an enlightenment, needs a kind of humanism. Why? Because there we find all these values and principles that I mentioned before. So our democracies are already inspired by these ideals. However, we in the actual institutions and in the, the way we deal with technology, um, these, these values are not sufficiently implemented. Uh, but there we can find inspiration um, and inspiration for dealing them with technology in this more constructive way. So for me, a digital humanism, which is sometimes also mentioned, for example, in the German context, is, is, shouldn't be a kind of a reactionary response to technology, saying like we, we are against technology, uh, but should be um, a way of using these technologies to um, achieve these um, uh, classic values. And um, there uh, one can look at various aspects within digital humanism uh, that, I, uh, that I distinguish. I also have a paper on this. Uh, first of all, I think that if we look at classical humanism, people use the technologies of their days, the printing press in particular, um, for creating uh, communities, intellectual communities, communities where indeed people uh, ideally listen to each other's view um, before shouting their own or uh, before shutting up the other person. So all these kind of values that are in the Republican ideal of, of, of democracy, um, we can find there and we can find them supported by technologies. And similarly, we could use digital technologies also to build these communities, communities of learning, like here in the academic context, but also political communities um, where people share knowledge and experience. Because if Arendt and others are right, we need uh, this basis of a shared uh, understanding and a shared world um, uh, in order to, to then talk with one another. Also, interdisciplinary education um, can mean that uh, technical people learn about ethics, but also not to forget that humanities people also learn about the deep impact that technology has in our society. So I think we need these two uh, sides. And then nowadays in the 21st century, I think we have to, of course, be um, critical about, about humanism in the sense that humanism in its classical form uh, was anthropocentric. Uh, we need to ask the question, what about non-humans? Uh, this is quite a topic on itself, uh, on its own, but I think it needs to be addressed as well uh, for anyone who calls himself, herself, themselves a human, humanist. Uh, and then finally, um, yeah, the, the active aspects which we already find in, in Rousseau, for example, and, and in Aristotle, um, the, the idea that you, you need to do something for your uh, political community. It doesn't mean necessarily, political community doesn't mean necessarily nation state, by the way, so this should be distinguished. Which form a political community should take is, a, of course, a long-standing question. And then finally, in the book, I say like, well, all this needs this normative direction, and this normative direction um, could be, the role of that could be played by the common good, the notion of common good. Um, and uh, to, to end, I would like to say a bit more about that. So um, in political philosophy, what, what can common good mean? First of all, it can mean um, common as opposed to, to private interests. Um, and there that, that fits with a yeah, discourse about uh, should big tech be, be only private or how should we, we deal with that? Um, but also the question like yeah, how to find that common good um, where there are substantive views, uh, definitions of the common good a priori, um, but also procedural approaches. Um, and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, and yeah, I, I talk about communication and the making of common goods. So what does that mean? Um, let me try to clarify this. So first of all, I think I'm, I'm very sympathetic to procedural theories. Why? Because um, yeah, it's, it's easier that you don't have to define the common good on beforehand. 
However, I then say like, if you're going to have your discussions and your political struggles, um, if you really want democracy to work, there needs to be something to start from. And if you don't have sufficient shared experience, if you don't have sufficient um, basic uh, agreement on a normative direction also, um, there is a problem. So I think the, the liberalism there needs to be um, uh, adapted in such a way that there is this uh, normative orientation and, and a priori um, uh, agreement on some things. Of course, this is a huge discussion, but this is like the, the, the direction I go. Um, also, uh, the temporal aspect is important. So um, when we ask a question about the common good, the question is, of course, the common good for whom? Uh, so we need to define a community, and I think that can be at various levels, including a global community, which is a very challenging notion, but I think needs to, we need to ask that question. And uh, also the next generations. Um, we cannot say the, the common is just about uh, us living today. We need to also think about the next generations. How far this should go is, uh, is again um, an issue. Uh, some people think it should go very far, a zillion generations. I think epistemically that's very difficult. How, how do we know what um, uh, generations in the far future want? So I think that but the next generation is something I think that we 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 uh, we can reasonably know, so we uh, so we could we could put a limit there. Um, if we then look at the discussions, about the current discussions about AI governance, I think that um, we shouldn't be too pessimistic about um, consensus. Uh, I think there there is quite a lot of consensus on general ethical principles today. Um, so, um, so maybe this, this discussion about the, um, like objections to, to some, something substantive is maybe uh, exaggerated a little bit. Um, what, where there is a lot, of, a lot less agreement is what this means in practice. And there, I think the big political struggles and tensions uh, become visible, namely what to do about private interests. Um, what, about, what do notions such as fairness or sustainability really mean? What does it imply for government policy and so on? So there I think we can and should have um, political discussion and that's okay because we need that space for politics. So there I agree with um, people like Chantal Mouffe and others. Um, it's rather dangerous when we don't have this. Um, but of course, it doesn't mean that we don't need to try to then reach agreements. So you cannot have political struggle endlessly. One needs to come to a closure there, I think, um, if we're serious about um, shaping our common technological future. Um, also, a deeper problem, I think, is if we stick with a very individualist, um, non-Republican interpretation of democracy, then, um, yeah, the, the problem is that, that citizens are seen as too much as kind of consumers of democracy um, rather than, than potential contributors. And potential contributors also means that um, if we really uh, have this more optimistic Rousseauian kind of view about people, that we can also, um, as a society, benefit from the creativity of people. Uh, people who have technical backgrounds, uh, but also other people um, who can help also to think, for example, about this question, how to use AI um, in, a, in, a, in a better democratic way. Um, but of course, this presupposes then an, an education, and I dare to mention this term civic education, um, uh, which of course got problematized by the uh, uh, totalitarianism and so on in the 20th century, but which I think should be... Um, it can also be given a more democratic um, uh, uh, meaning. And um, yeah, finally then I use the term communication. Um, I think given that um, this, the passive tolerance of classical liberalism is not enough, uh, but this engagement which is sort of point of view and so on, I think this communication, communication in the sense of talking with one another, but also communication in the sense of making community, but in a non-communitarian way, where, whereas um, the, let's say, conservative communitarian sees community as given and as predefined, 
here community is being made uh, through communication. Um, and that meaning of communication, by the way, is also different than the technical meaning of uh, transferring a message from A to B. Um, so this is also a kind of criticism of a certain tradition in uh, computer and information science. So to conclude, um, I think we need to recognize the political dimension of um, this topic of AI and the common good, um, avoiding authoritarian interpretations and uh, making sure that there's a democratization. But I think we need some substantive agreement as well. Um, and uh, yeah, instead of just only having this struggle and contestation, which are important, the possibility always to contest, um, we also need uh, to think about notions such as civic duty, um, civic education and so on. Uh, where we rely then, uh, once we have that education, on the creativity of people um, to positively contribute to um, more flourishing and the common good. And I think this kind of ideal, uh, Republican-inspired ideal, um, yeah, on the one hand helps us to, to look, you know, to, to, uh, gives us a tool to look critically at the current discussions about AI, which are not participative enough not uh, active and creative on the part of the assumptions about citizens and uh, are not supported by this, these background conditions. Um, I think a more Republican understanding of democracy, uh, including the notion of common good, can inspire us to uh, democratize, democratize in general, but also democratize um, uh, our uh, discussions about our uh, common future with technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. We'll now have our first set of comments by Professor Zeynep Pamuk. Oh, shall we uh, switch? Mark, thank you so much for a very stimulating talk. It was really the most relevant, most pressing issues that you raise. And I think uh, I speak for many in saying that how to democratize AI the need to democratize it and the need to think about what best serves that purpose is really um, the question we should be thinking about as, as academics, as citizens, as, um, as anyone concerned about the, the future of our world. Uh, I want to start by asking a set of questions about your choice of focusing on the idea of the common good. I mean, on the, on the face of it, this seems like an unobjectionable, um, attractive ideal, but it's also a highly criticized concept in political theory. So you, you draw on a strain of thinking that has um, promoted it, that has been in support of it, but there's also a very strong tradition of being very suspicious of the common good. Uh, I'd, I'd like to think it can be a very attractive ideal, but in highly idealized conditions. So people like Rousseau, they emphasize that the common good makes sense in a society in which citizens come together as equals, as free citizens, where the, the politics is participatory, face to face. But we live in an age that is far from this ideal. Um, this is an age of deep inequality and polarization where politics is very conflictual. Um, and I'm probably less optimistic that we have a broad consensus on the kinds of values um, that we need to govern AI. So my question basically is, is it possible to even conceive of a good that is in common between groups whose interests, values, and needs seem to be so opposed and contradictory? Specifically in the case of AI, uh, we can ask whether something that's in the interest of corporations is also in the interest of workers. Can it be? Can we find a commonality between these two groups? Um, perhaps just as importantly or more importantly is something that is in the interest of consumers also in the interests of workers since consumers make, make the, up the vast majority um, of citizens since everyone is most people are, are consumers uh, of this economy and we know for example that a lot of citizens when they are asked about their satisfaction with ai companies with these big tech companies say that at least in their role as people who purchase and enjoy cheap, convenient goods, they are very satisfied. 
So it's not entirely true that despite the fact that few people make the decisions, there's deep dissatisfaction. Yes, when you queue citizen identities, there is concern and there's anxiety about the future. But on the other hand, people are quite happy. People like their iPhones, people like their deliveries, people like getting um, products for cheap. Uh, and in political theory, again, alongside the common good tradition you mentioned, there is a long tradition that emphasizes these kinds of conflicts. So for example, um, we can focus on class-based or Marxist analyses, but also feminist scholars and scholars of race have always harbored deep suspicion of the idea of common good. Um, that, for example, women's interests or the interests of minorities will be or can be incorporated into the good um, that comes out of political processes. So one concern about this is, of course, procedural, that these voices will be silenced in the kinds of democratic processes we have. But even if the procedure runs better, that we have the kinds of norms of, of equality and reciprocity, the question remains, can there be a good in common? Is it genuinely possible to conceive of it, to come upon it? Um, how do we know that this is possible? And democratic deliberation can be very good under the right circumstances, but I think it's, it's fair to say that consensus is usually not possible, so it inevitably ends with a majority vote. So what guarantee is there that a majority of citizens, especially today, who are so fully in their role as consumers, will care about the plight of those others who are the, the most vulnerable in the AI-driven technological world that we live in? Deliberative democracy has been criticized for ignoring these differences, ignoring differences of power and, and um, who speaks up in these kinds of settings and presuming that what would make sense under idealized conditions of equality also makes sense in our imperfect political world. And looking at the, the literature on AI that's, that's been developing, that's actually quite um, expansive now, it's, it's interesting to see that there's a lot of work that focuses on um, the racial bias of AI, the, the gendered nature of a lot of AI technologies. Um, there have been works that focus on um, the bias of, of ChatGPT or search engines, um, the harms to minorities, women, workers. So even though at first it seems like your focus on the common good seems like a, a really uncontroversial broadly attractive ideal, actually I see you as going against the grain a little bit, at least within academic discourses, um, where you focus on how AI benefits the few but harms the most, where there are many others who are focusing on how AI is really harming a small segment of the most vulnerable. These are fairly different approaches, so I was wondering why you think the common approach, common good approach is better um, than these other approaches. I now want to ask more concrete, more um, specific questions about how to get from here to there, assuming we agree on the there. Broadly, that it would be desirable for AI technology to be more democratic, more inclusive in some sense, um, more participatory certainly, maybe more Republican, um, certainly more democratic. I, I wouldn't contest that in any way. How do we do that? Because it seems to me that there are deep structural obstacles to getting there, um, and we need to think specifically about, um, well, something you raised yourself, so I want to just ask you to elaborate on the relationship between the private and the public. So the turn to deliberative democracy or the kinds of deliberative experiments that you highlight um, has some limitations, not only because there have been concerns about their impact and their uptake. So this is, this is popular among citizens, um, but there's always a question of what, whether the result of deliberation actually gets incorporated into policy, how that process works, whether these actually have any effect or whether they just, um, you know, they, they satisfy people's needs for participation, but ultimately make very little difference in the real world. So that's, that's one worry. But the other worry is that they usually are run in areas where the questions themselves are political, so it's a matter of convincing policymakers or legislatures um, that they should listen, that they have to take up these suggestions. But in the AI case, I, I see the problem a bit differently 
because the decisions are not, even though the decisions are of a political nature, and you're very right to emphasize that, they're not in the hands of politicians to make alone. A lot of these decisions are in the hands of private companies. Um, so the problem here is what does it even mean to make these decisions open to deliberation? So does that mean bringing citizens into the boardrooms of these companies? Does that mean running these experiments and then hoping that companies listen? Um, or does it mean something a lot more radical than that? So I, I think you're right to emphasize the limits of talking about regulation and emphasizing that what we need is more attention to the development of technology. Uh, but what does that mean? So I, I want to ask if you have institutional uh, proposals for that, if you've thought about the, the relationship between um, the corporation and the public, how far um, political decision making can be incorporated, democracy can be incorporated into the corporation, um, whether the, the public, private or market state relationship has to be changed, and how how radical you're willing to go. So would you say that this is possible under the current economic organization of society, under a capitalist society, or would you follow people who want much more radical, dramatic change, um, a different economic organization altogether? Um, so do you have concrete ideas for getting us to where we all want to get? Thank you very much. Thank you, Zainab. We'll now hand over to Isabel, and then you'll get a chance to respond. Okay. Well, thank you, Marc, for this uh, very important work. Um, I must say I, I share uh, Marc's constructive perspective uh, at AI, and I really love the question, what can AI do for democracy? I think that is not an insignificant question. Um, so my departure point is not going to be um, critical. It will be um, 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 basically reinforcing. Um, Mark says that basically uh, the only way we can have a, a sustainable democracy is to share a world in common. And Zeynep rightly uh, raised questions that have been uh, discussed in uh, the field of political philosophy, um, and I am not uh, going to position myself between the Republican tradition and uh, the more liberal tradition, um, because I will claim for my, my first attachment to the field of sociology, so that will be easy. Um, and, but I would like to um, highlight uh, this central idea that I think is very um, um, powerful is that indeed um, we, we cannot envision a sustainable democracy if there is not something in common. That something can be very light, it can be a very thin um, uh, core, uh, and so indeed in the Republican tradition there are um, probably too, too thick um, uh, claims, but um, I think it would be fair to say that Marx's uh, commitment uh, is very reasonable in the sense that uh, how I uh, have read you is that you um, entrust uh, a commitment to um, a, a procedural attitude toward what is common. And so that the idea that there is a commitment that if we want to live in a democracy, uh, we want we are committing to the idea that we should all, one way or another, have an ability to um, wait on the decisions that are taken and that we should find the appropriate procedures uh, to pursue that uh, goal. And by doing that, we are building that world in common that make it for the possibility to have um, a democracy as a political project. So uh, I think there is probably not a more um, normative uh, uh, project necessary at a time where our humanity is at risk of losing its um, only home and where all our major problems are common problems actually, the war and peace, um, 
indeed the climate crisis, the major defining problems of the day are uh, and should be uh, a common uh, problems. So um, here I wanted to um, insist on uh, a specific understanding that I think the, the Republican tradition has highlighted in a very um, um, pointed way, which is the fact that citizens are not envisioned only as beneficiaries of rights, but that they are also envisioned as uh, bearing a duty to contribute. And um, uh, Marx said that very clearly. And of course, these days, and that's a problem, we have, for instance, in France, the, the, the president of France insisting on uh, the fact that citizens are, have lost of sight that you know, obligation to contribute, and somehow we face a citizenry that is very passive, very disengaged, and that it is, it would be a duty of uh, mindful leaders to uh, re remind uh, people that they have a duty to contribute. Um, here, I would like to suggest that there is no better domain of uh, life uh, than the work life to think about this problem. And as it happens, AI is actually generated in the work life. So it's a very significant domain of life to study or to understand if uh, we want to understand the uh, intricacies of, of this problem. Basically, at work, um, what we see, and I'm a sociologist of work, um, firstly, is that people are very much willing to contribute. People are uh, actually better defined as uh, labor investors. They invest their own person into their work, and especially in a service-based economy. So people actually to deliver a service that works, they really have to be fully invested in what they're doing. And so uh, they understand they have um, rights, not many rights actually in the workplace, but they have a lot of responsibility and they have a lot of, uh, they, they face a lot of expectations that they should contribute. And this is what actually happens on an everyday basis. And yet, that is a domain where actually that contribution is not taken seriously. It's not taken seriously enough uh, in the sense that it does not, um, it does not um, 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 produce any rights. Precisely that um, investment in the work that people uh, uh, do does not produce an ability to have a say on the decisions that actually uh, are defining for the type of service that is pursued by the, the firm, the type of production that is uh, per pursued. And in that sense, uh, in most settings today, workers do not have the right to bear on the government of their own life and the consequences that these decisions have on other people's life. And here I wanted to uh, bring the example of OpenAI, which was so um, nicely uh, publicized last December, when we uh, could really see an exception in uh, the, the, the economy uh, uh, um, for, for all of us to witness, which was that in that particular setting, of a firm which, where the rules of capitalism are actually not in place, there was the possibility for workers to have the right to validate or veto the decisions of the firm. Because when 600 of them said, no, we want that CEO back, well, what the board had to do was just to bring the guy back. There was no other way that firm would continue to operate uh, without uh, actually um, um, uh, recognizing that uh, um, informal right that the workers at OpenAI have um, in order to um, uh, bear on the government of the firm. 
But that is really exceptional. That was exceptional. And um, here, um, I wanted to bring in um, the, the, the point that Mark uh, made about uh, uh, Dewey's perspective on the democratic experiment. Uh, and in that uh, perspective, certainly uh, supporting the, the Republican tradition that there is no a priori conception of the common good, but that there is this commitment that it's together that we're going to find out um, what is the common good? What is substantially uh, the good that should be pursued? Given the procedural nature of AI, actually, uh, it is it is very striking that indeed as it's never set once and for all, but that AI is in itself constantly evolving in its ways, in its contents. Um, when you think about the nature of generative AI, it's so clear. It is clear that the essence of AI regulation should lie in some form of a democratic procedural justice. That those who actually produce it and that those who actually are going to be governed by it have a truly meaningful say uh, on uh, these eventual content. And so when we think about both the development of AI and the deployment of AI in other um, uh, work environment and in uh, society in general, uh, it is very significant, I think, to, to raise the uh, concern that those who are governed by the decisions that AI is actually producing uh, and those who are producing it actually have a radical meaningful say on, on it. And in, from that perspective, we actually have a few uh, significant, even the weak signs going into that direction. And I would just like to give two examples. Uh, the Hollywood uh, writers uh, strike last year, which was very um, uh, publicized, uh, well, led to an agreement which is really groundbreaking because the, the, the union gained actually in a collective bargaining the right to basically co-govern the way AI is going to be uh, implemented into these uh, writers' um, work life. And so there is, a, um, um, a, 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 there is put in place a, a six-month review uh, th um, through which uh, employers and uh, 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 workers' representatives uh, agreed to convene to uh, assess the way AI is evolving as a tool and the way it is going to be or not uh, included, which exact tools, etc. All that is a matter of a deliber collective deliberation. And that uh, the, 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 the commitment is to co-govern these uh, technological development. I think that's a very hopeful sign going into the direction of a democratic um, um, uh, government of the use of AI in that specific industry. Uh, if we look closer at the EU level, you have the Platform Work Directive, which is in full discussion and not necessarily going into the right direction right now, but in the text, there is this very interesting notion that workers should have the ability to know about the algorithms that are um, imposed on them or that are going to govern them and that they should have the ability to use the digital tools of the firm to coordinate among themselves to nurture their own views about these algorithms, the, the impacts that they are going to have and that they should have the right to uh, have a say on these algorithms. It's certainly not going... Um, uh, um, um, uh, strongly enough in the direction of really empowering workers to have a decisive right on these algorithms, 
algorithms. I'm sorry, that's a very difficult word. But uh, it is certainly uh, hopeful that the discussion is going into that direction. Um, Linda, how many minutes do, do I have left? Should I stop here? Not that many. If you're happy to stop, then we can um, respond. Maybe take one more. Maybe question. one, yeah, because I had more, but uh, I don't want to. So just one last point then, um, which brings me to the point of the, um, uh, a point that Zeynep also uh, made. Uh, I, I think uh, it is really um, a clear for Marx from Marx, um, um, analysis that uh, we all witness today the weak capacity of states to regulate these developments, basically to govern. We're not even talking about governing them. And so um, I think we have to take very seriously the concern to rebuild some public capacity. And I would like to emphasize the perspective that actually democratizing firms, that is to uh, give to workers a real right to co-govern firms, will steer the power balance into a much more um, uh, healthy uh, uh, direction, which is uh, one central way through which we can regain um, a mutually beneficial relationship between power, between uh, public power and, um, and corporations. Because as long as we keep corporations, especially at being transnational, at that scale, dwarfing our states, it's very clear that we are never going to bring uh, ourselves as a humanity capable to, um, um, to govern um, the, the future. So that um, public capacity has to be a central concern. And here, I think the discussion about democratizing AI and democratizing corporations really bring also um, a hopeful perspective uh, for that uh, very ambitious quest. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And thank you both for two wonderfully rich sets of comments. Before we open up um, to questions from the audience, I want to give Mark a chance to respond. There's plenty of material there. Why don't you take a few minutes? Thank you. Yes, I will keep it brief. Um, yeah, thank you both for your comments. Very uh, helpful. Maybe I start with uh, the last one and then uh, move to the, the other ones. Uh, first of all, I, I really uh, agree with you that the, this, this work context and, and the uh, within a corporation that there are also questions about democratization and I'm very sympathetic to your proposals of co-governance and this is really something that's missing in the book. Uh, I think it's, it's a good point to, to add that this can also be a site of uh, democratization and also democratic learning in fact, right? Um, so uh, absolutely let's, let's go in that direction also. Um, if, uh, po in political philosophy, I would support that by my critical response to Aaron to say like, you know, political action and work should not be uh, distinguished in, in that uh, absolute way. And we should, in a sense, politicize uh, also work and, uh, and also, by the way, all the, the other uh, domains. Um, so the, I, I agree with, with that. Um, when it comes to the criticism of the common good, uh, I think there, these are valid points of concern. And uh, um, I, I just think that um, uh, to, to, to conclude from the fact that uh, the appeals to the common good are sometimes used to impose one particular kind of uh, interests on those of others, um, that, that this happened, I think, is not sufficient argument to say like that the, the general normative orientation is wrong. Um, so I think we should distinguish there. Um, it's definitely a concern to always make sure that the majority doesn't oppress the minority or minorities. This is, of course, known since Tocqueville and so on. Um, 
And uh, that's why exactly I think a richer democratic ideal is needed, because if you have a like, kind of mechanical voting sort of idea of majority wins uh, only, then, uh, then I think we get exactly in that, in that type of um, troubles. Um, when it comes to recognizing that we have things in common, uh, I agree that there, of course, we should uh, recognize that there are also like interests that clash between different groups, for example. Um, but I do think that there are also um, common interests. And a good example is, is the environmental sphere, uh, where, of course, uh, we, it's not that one group needs a different kind of air than another group, right? So we all need clean air. Uh, we all want peace, uh, as the other example was given. And um, I also think we all want uh, um, technologies that, uh, that contribute to our flourishing and, and are fair and so on. And in practice, empirically, actually, so, that's, uh, so that was so far like more theoretical argument, but empirically, I see a lot of conversions in the area of AI on these general principles. Um, where I think that the interest of different groups uh, could play out is then, of course, to say like, yeah, what, for example, what kind of justice uh, do we want and, and what does it mean justice and fairness and so on. Um, and there I, I think uh, that we, we need to have a political uh, play where, where the, the, you know, th that needs to be inclusive and that needs to hear the people who, who claim that their interests are and, and uh, their point of view is not heard. Um, so I think there at that level, I totally agree. Um, but yeah, the, the pendulum has swung a lot to the side of uh, difference and of, um, of, of recognizing all this the diverse interest. And, and I think needs to go a little bit uh, uh, more to also the recognition that we, uh, we, we we share some things also, some shared interest, and we need to work towards something shared in the end. Um, and I think if we forget that, then uh, yeah, we have an endless struggle, and that's that's not going to help us to to build that kind of uh, common future. I I think we should. On that optimistic note, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you all so much. I'll give you a chance to respond um, at the very end also. Let's start uh, here in the front. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your research. I had a two part question. Um, I, I found what you mentioned about education very fascinating. I am in the Department of Education. Um, to begin with, you mentioned right now about building shared interest. Um, it's interesting because a lot of what we see is a lot of personalization of education. So the more there is a emphasis on using education as a means of creating shared identity, shared learning spaces, on the other hand, procedurally education is becoming more individualistic, personalized tailored. So um, I, I was curious if you have on that, like more from a pedagogy sense that when is the pedagogy that the way we're using tech for education is it sort of, will it help in getting towards your ideal? Um, the second was more on the agency part, you sort of referenced Dewey, you mentioned about civic education. Um, historically, there's been accountability for that. It is um, for the good or the bad, the state that's responsible for the civic education. Um, I can speak about India's process where when we got independent, um, civic education was done for the democratic procedure where we adopted symbols instead of names so that even say someone who couldn't read and write could participate in the democratic process. Now that sort of the material procedure of democracy is changing with a lot of the AI technology you mentioned about assemblies. Um, how does that education sort of take place and who does it? Because education is now more privatized and commercialized than it's ever been. So is it a tech company that's responsible for it? Is it a government? Um, and, and how do we make sense of that? So while I love the point on education, I, I struggle in sort of understanding where does the accountability lie and how do we look at it from a procedural perspective in just imparting education? Thank you. 
Yes, thank you for your uh, question. Shall I answer directly? Yes. Um, so, um, with regard to your first question, I think that, um, of course, we should learn from people who study education already for ages and, and uh, also listen to, to people like you for concrete proposals. But um, what I see um, in, the, in the light of this ideal of digital humanism uh, is that our education is very academic in a way that it's like done per subject. And uh, something that I think would help is if we could organize it um, in a way both at schools and uh, higher education that, that we are uh, talking about problems, uh, for example, climate change uh, or another uh, problem that is seen as a, a societal problem, and then bring the different disciplines and different perspectives. Uh, and I think this would help to, to create an, uh, more interdisciplinary skills, uh, which people don't have so much today. Um, who is responsible? I think the privatization of education is a huge problem in the light of the uh, ideal that I've been talking about. So I think something needs to be done about that, so that it uh, is at least regulated in such a way that the civic component is there. Um, and uh, companies can also, uh, of course, contribute to that. But there I would always be critical and, and think like, yeah, what kind of interests are behind it? And, and yeah, we should see how to deal with that. Um, but, I, but I think that's, uh, that, of course, different actors in society have to, their responsibility to play. Um, I just think that the more public uh, ownership of the problem there would, would help. Um, enormously. Thank you. Zainab, Isabel, anything you want to add? Um, at this stage, I'd prefer to hear from the audience. Great. More questions? Uh, let's go to Sally. Uh, oh, can people hear me? Oh, great. Um, so I just wanted to press a little bit on the kind of last thing you said about the move towards the common good. So if we have kind of only nominally shared values, right, so we don't have any sense of how they conduce towards actual material change in the world. So is that not kind of playing a slightly obfuscatory role where sort of like a corporation could say something like, yeah, I'm working towards the common good, but not actually have any sense of what that means and not actually because is it a bit, I don't want to say useless, if a corporation can just say that and it not actually generate any kind of change. And on that kind of point of uh, another thing that I think Zenab said was this idea of kind of a material consequences and the material structures in place that render certain incentives more or less valuable. Um, it was kind of this idea of how do we even begin to set up like rich democratic processes where people can have a say. So like when Meta buys 30 times more chips than like the UK government or when like I think um, Ireland's power will go from like a sixth to a third all dedicated towards data centers by like I think 2026, um, all of these material structures means that power is getting more and more concentrated and material um, material power, if that is all the power that we're kind of interested in here. So how do we actually begin to, when corporations have such power, generate these democratic processes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for, for that question. Um, so first of all, I think that it's a problem that um, uh, and, and there, of course, I agree with the, with the criticism of common good that sometimes it is used um, to mask interest. And, and uh, in that case, we see that today big tech is exactly doing that. They, they, they would um, say, I, I agree with you, Mark, you know, like a common good. And we're all for the common good. And we're going to do AI for the common good. Yeah. And it would be on their websites and in their documents and so on. And consultants will help to, to develop it. But the, the, in the meantime, uh, of course, they will have their own very specific understanding of what that means. And so that's why there needs to be a, a democratization of, uh, of the, the thinking about what it means and about the decision making around it. Uh, and otherwise, it's just uh, empty rhetoric, of course. Um, with regard to the material conditions, yeah, I think it shows that we need to um, think about how to um, redistribute the, the material uh, infrastructure needed for uh, these technologies. Um, if we leave it as it is, it's too centralized, uh, both in 
in more uh, laissez-faire uh, environments, but also authoritarian uh, governments. So I think the, the, the democratic solution is to say like, yeah, we need to have something in common, also materially speaking. Of course, then there's the, the political question, how far should that go? Should it mean public ownership of everything or, or not? And that also links back a little bit to the first commons. Uh, so my concrete proposal is like, okay, maybe we cannot agree all on a complete public ownership of everything, but uh, what we could agree on is uh, what we already do in the case sometimes of water or energy, that, uh, that it's completely acceptable that there is a, 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 at least partly a, a public participation in these companies. And that, of course, guarantees that some public interests are represented there. So that's a concrete solution uh, to, to do that. We have the, the, the legal um, means to do that um, if we think that it is in, in such an interest for society. Zainab, do you want to add to that? No, I'd like to hear more questions. OK, fantastic. Um, more questions? John. Thanks so much, Mark. I think what was really exciting about your talk is you're breaking from the two dominant paradigms of AI ethics. One is the strongly utilitarian one that talks about the common good, but in an aggregative way, um, talks about value alignment as simply fulfilling aggregate preferences, and which plays out economically as prioritizing economic growth above everything else. So you see this in the UK government's white paper. And the other thing that you're breaking against, I think, is a purely rights-based approach that we see with the EU that says, really, it's about subjecting these sorts of concerns to individual rights. My question, I guess, is how you would flesh out your departure from those two views. So, for example, you put in place of the utilitarian view of the common good a purely formal conception. But I wonder if that's too empty, because what if people did, through a formal conception, endorse utilitarianism? with all its attendant problems of sacrificing some on the altar of the greater good. Would that make it a correct conception of the common good, simply because it passed the process? Or has your concept of the common good actually got some teeth that rules that out? And the other, on, from the other side, on the right side, how far do you go with your skepticism about experts? Because a lot of people are going to say, Democracy is fine, but only as long as it operates within guardrails established by an independent class of experts called judges who specify what our rights are and ensures that whatever common good is decided upon operates within the confines of rights that have been specified pre-democratically. Pre so are you willing to join those of us who are skeptical about that juristocracy, or are you still saying your concept of the common good really does require a pre-filtering by a class of experts. Uh, the last thing related to your question, just as a matter of interest for me, what do you think is the biggest threat posed by AI to democracy? Is it asymmetries ultimately in knowledge or in economic power? Hmm. Yeah, great questions. Um, with regard to utilitarianism, um, I think because I made it sort of a substantivist um, disclaimer, if you like, or, or you know, adaptation of the procedural view, uh, I do think that that uh, there are some objectively um, uh, good definitions of common good that um, that should give us a stronger normative basis to rule out some of the uh, like utilitarian excesses, at least. Um, the, the juridical power, I think, the juridical power, I do mention the constitution in my uh, book, and I think that the uh, juridical pillar of, uh, is also a pillar of democracy in the sense that it can um, uh, safeguard, for example, rule of law and uh, some basic things that we have in place in, in a demo uh, to make also the, the, the conditions for the democracy. Um, but uh, we have to watch out that our uh, other institutions of democracy are not so weak that we always have to rely on the juridical uh, in order to, to uh, do what is actually pro uh, properly political. 
so I think we, we need to strengthen the, um, more the, the classic institutions like Parliament and, uh, and build these other institutions that are, um, that are more deliberative uh, so that the, the juridical is only there in, uh, f for the individual rights and for the constitutional rights, but isn't, like, um, isn't there to fill in the gaps that are currently not filled by the, the system. Um, and that I see very much in yeah, many countries playing now. And then, of course, the juridical experts get too much power, and uh, that's a problem. Uh, with economic power and knowledge, um, I think the, the, the two are connected because the, the reason why currently there is a lot of economic power on the part of uh, um, companies like OpenAI is that they do have a lot of knowledge. Uh, Google has a lot of knowledge. So I think to democratize knowledge uh, can help also to deal with the uh, political economy problem. Um, but yeah, so for me that the two are related and uh, it would not be right to talk about all the other things and not about the, the strong economic power of, the, of these companies. Great, unless there's anything you two wanna to add, we'll go to more questions and then we can go to closing remarks. Yeah, over here. Thank you again for the wonderful talk. Um, I share your enthusiasm about uh, the, toward the principles of open democracy and towards some of the you know, innovative ideas being explored around collective uh, deliberation. But I was wondering if you could say something about speed. I worry that one of the risks for democratic resilience in the light of AI is the relative difference in how fast AI is improving versus how quickly democratic processes seem to be able to respond, even if it were to adopt more open democratic principles, or perhaps that would actually even make the, the delta worse. So that delta feels large and getting larger, and do you have any just reflections on that? Yeah, it's a uh, good point. Um, I, I think what's currently happening is that these, uh, these more ad hoc advisory councils, for example, and, and the, the way that, that, for example, EU policy on this developed, it, it's much too slow. And I agree that, that like, it isn't working like it, like it does. Um, and that, that's why I propose this deliberative moment already at the stage of development. I think it's really the only way to, to deal with it. Of course, how exactly, you know, how, what it should look like is uh, not so obvious and, and how to Im implement that. Um, but, but I think it's the, the, the only way we can do it. Um, also, this new institution that I proposed that would sit between the democratically and elected bodies and the uh, experts, um, I think should be able to respond much more quickly uh, than is currently the, the case with, um, with agencies or, or um, policy making bodies um, because the, the development is so, is so fast. Um, and um, I think it, this, this can be uh, done by having already um, a kind of normative instrument in place that then can be made more operational quickly with regard to new technologies. Um, so that not every time the whole bigger normative framework has to be debated. Okay, we have just a few minutes left and I want to make sure that everyone gets to share some final reflections. So I suggest that we start with you, Isabel, you take a couple of minutes to share some thoughts, then we'll go to Zeynep and then you might get the final word. Um, well, thank you so much. Of course, I won't be able to um, I just say one 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 point. Um, I think it's um, it's very clear that there is this speed element that is a problem, uh, but at uh, the same time it is part of the solution uh, because um, it's an additional reason why we want to empower workers. And actually, there is this um, generally there is this idea that worker why work what why would workers uh, necessarily ta would take more ethical decisions? It's, it's generally uh, questioned. And um, my sense is that when you look factually at that problem, you have actually um, uh, all the reasons to believe that workers would side on uh, a much more ethical um, um, side than uh, 
um, 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 a profit-driven uh, actor. It is very clear from many examples uh, that um, uh, uh, workers, I can think of uh, development in the, um, you know, uh, when in Vol at Volkswagen uh, 15 years ago, uh, there was this pollution scandal disclosed. It was actually, um, it came, uh, uh, it became very clear that uh, there was, there were actually a lot of workers who knew about that, who felt that they had not the ability to, uh, uh, um, to, to dare to speak about that, because even though it is the context of a, a, a fairly democratized corporation, because there is the Mitbestimmung in place in Germany, it's actually not powerful enough as a counterpower to provide workers the, 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 the right to veto the decisions of the firm. And so it's uh, actually very important, I think, to inject in this debate the understanding that if we are not happy with a profit-driven rationality, which is what's at stake here, and of course all these decisions should not be made in the name of profit, at least profit alone, profit can be one dimension for these decisions to be made, actually workers are the best proxy you have to inject at the very conception moment and then uh, enlarge, of course, the demos, but at the level of conception to inject that right for workers to know that they can actually voice their ethical concern because at the board level, they have the power to counterbalance uh, whatever decisions that um, a profit-driven actor, which are those who inject capital, uh, will uh, side for. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Zainab. I was just trying to make a list from uh, all the comments in this discussion about the kinds of specific proposals that we could act on to democratize, either democratize the corporation or democratize AI. So this is, this is just a list. I, I really liked Isabel's example of the Hollywood writer strike, that the strike increasing workers' organization, that's, that's one possibility. Uh, workers' cooperatives, there's a very interesting literature on that. I don't think they, they form a significant part of the economy right now, but um, that's something to think about. Uh, one possibility that Mark mentioned is public ownership. So that, that's quite interesting. I've studied um, scientific funding uh, by public bodies. And that's, of course, a huge amount of where innovation came from. It seems to have a different feel now with the AI space that somehow governments and public funding is falling behind and it's very privatized. But this is obviously has always been a, a, a source of directing technological innovation and, and its impact on society just to publicly fund um, technological goods um, through basic research and more applied. Uh, another is, is maybe thinking of regulating some of these companies as infrastructural goods, um, as having a, a, a key role in providing something like the internet or a search engine um, or social media platform that is so essential to the functioning of um, society that it's a basic need. And so it has to be treated like electricity or water. Um, so these are, these are some ideas. I, I think they, they're all interesting and worth examining further. So if, if there are others out there, students, researchers who want to come up with more ideas, this, this list should be expanded. Thank you so much, Mark, Isabel, Linda, um, the Ethics in AI Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zainab. And final reflections from Mark. Yeah, it's not a last word because last words are not democratic. Um, but um, yeah, well, I was thinking like something that is a little bit, bit like behind um, the, the, um, the skepticism of common good, I think, is that we you know, we had this, this authoritarian and totalitarian understandings of common good, of course. And uh, the, the reaction was then, uh, often the libertarian reaction was like to, to completely go the other side. So I think the challenge politically is, of course, to, for our societies to find some kind of common uh, and common good that, that is, of course, not understood author in an authoritarian way. Um, but, but still is something that we can have in common. Um, 
And uh, so th that is like politically, I think, a big challenge that is behind some of the challenges then also in the area of technology uh, policy and, and, and uh, thinking about the future of technology. With that, we have our instructions. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Mark Hackelberg, Zeynep Pamuk and Isabel Ferreras. Thank you.